So I wanted to talk about this video. This was shared by Ryan Grimm. I think that the headline here kind of says it all. This is courtesy of The Intercept. Media presses for weapons instead of diplomacy in Ukraine. Now, I've critiqued the coverage of the Ukraine-Russia invasion because I don't like the way that the media very flippantly advocates for World War III by coding that in a no-fly zone language. I mean, when you call something as serious as a no-fly zone a no-fly zone, you kind of sanitize it, when in actuality that is essentially a declaration of war against Russia. So if you are on the mainstream media and you're asking the president or the vice president or some senator if we should have a no-fly zone, you can't just say, do you support a no-fly zone? You have to explain to the public what that is. There was a poll, and I think that David Dole actually did a video about this, that um, it looked at public support for a no-fly zone, and most Americans supported it until they found out what was entailed with the no-fly zone. So people are supporting something because there's this implication because of the way that it's discussed in the media that it's good and would bring about peace when in actuality the opposite is true. But overall, this just really shows you that the media, they are pushing for a particular position and they are trying to opt for escalation. I don't know how else to put it. But thankfully, Jen Psaki, I feel like, has been doing a pretty good job. Biden, Harris... They've all been doing a fairly good job, or I should say decent job. I don't want to give them too much credit, but they've been resisting calls to escalate with regard to a no-fly zone, and I'm thankful for that. But uh, take a look here at the the questions that they ask, the way that the media reporters here frame it. It's really frustrating to me because there's no sense that they care at all about diplomacy. It's all escalate, escalate, escalate. Why aren't you escalating further? It's insane. Zelensky and other Ukrainian officials have made so clear that what they believe they need the most is more warplanes and fighter jets. So why is the U.S. assessing something different? Why does the U.S. believe they know better what Ukraine needs than what Ukrainian officials are saying they need the most? It sounds like, you know, we're pretty dug in on our position when it comes to the no-fly zone, when it comes to... World uh, War III. Politics, uh, despite this growing call, bipartisan call in Congress to shift a little bit. So, to put it bluntly, is Zelensky wasting his time tomorrow? asking for these things. President Zelensky is going to be speaking to Congress tomorrow. He's been pushing for fighter jets, a no-fly zone. You have to hear some of those same requests tomorrow as well. Has the administration shift, thinking shifted on that at all? Julia, though, calling for a no-fly zone. They're a NATO member. They share a border with Russia. How do we view their calls for a no-fly zone? And on President Zelensky's address tomorrow, of course, he is expected to ask for more assistance, as my colleague noted. A lot of the U.S. positions on that haven't changed, as you just said, when it comes to the no-fly zone. But on the aircraft specifically, the Pentagon said last week that Secretary Austin said they do not support the transfer of additional fighter aircraft at this time. Is that still the United States' position? Would a, a strike in Poland on supplies or, or, or anything, really, uh, automatically be met with a military, a forceful response, or simply a conversation amongst allies about how to respond? There are reports that a Russian drone made its way into uh, Polish airspace before going back to Ukraine and being shot down. Does a drone into Poland count? Former ambassador to Ukraine, Maria Ivanovich, has been quite outspoken recently. And she said, we need to mitigate risk, but it's also true that not taking greater action comes with a risk as well, because Putin is a bully and he only understands strength. Is the president showing enough strength against Putin? Putin were to use chemical weapons, would it change the president's thinking when it comes to these MiGs taking the no-fly zone off the table, but at least on this issue? Are you prepared? Can you give us any more details about what that threat means of severe consequences? The president obviously made the same threat last week. Is that purely economic consequences, or would there potentially be a military threat? Go ahead. So, aside from the request for weapons, President Zelensky has also requested that the U.S. be more involved in negotiations toward a peaceful resolution to the war. What is the U.S. doing to push those negotiations forward? Well, 
one of the steps we've taken, a significant one, is to be the largest provider of military and humanitarian and economic assistance in the world to put them in a greater position of strength as they go into these negotiations. We also engage and talk to the Ukrainians on a daily basis. And the president and this national security team has, has uh, rallied the world in being unified in their opposition to the actions of President Putin. So those are the steps we're taking. We also engage uh, oftentimes before and after any conversations that any of these uh, global leaders are having with both Russians and Ukrainians and encourage them to make sure they're engaging with Ukrainians directly. So would Zelensky be empowered by the United States to reach an agreement with Russia and have U.S. sanctions. Notice how Ryan Grimm is the only person who's asking about diplomacy. Um, I'm going to pause it right here because I want to show you this video from Biden. So when they ask about a no-fly zone and why the administration hasn't shifted or has their position shifted, uh, that would be a direct confrontation with Russia. And I think that Biden made it very clear what that means here. I'm surprised to support Ukraine. We're going to continue to stand together with our allies in Europe and send an unmistakable message that we will defend every inch of NATO territory, every single inch, with a united, galvanized NATO. One movement. That's why I've moved over 12,000 American forces along the borders with Russia, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Romania, etc. Because they move once. Granted, if we respond, it is World War III, but we have a sacred obligation on NATO territory, a sacred obligation, Article 5. Your... So it was quick, but he's he laid it out. If we respond, it's World War Three. I think we should, we should watch that again because it's kind of a big deal. If we respond, it is World War Three. but we... If we respond, it is World War Three. So he's laying out the stakes here. So when these journalists are asking this question, uh, you know, about, well, I mean, Zelensky is calling for a no-fly zone. Is he wasting his time? Do you understand this isn't some light thing? I mean, you all understand it, but the reporters, I feel like, don't. Yeah, as Ford puts it, it's like adding gas to a fire. I mean, if you want to create a world war and expand suffering orders of magnitude more, then that's how you go about doing it. Um, there was, I think it was Gail King, maybe? I can't remember who said it in an interview with Kamala Harris, but she was like, you ruled out boots on the ground. Uh, but there are people who are suffering, children suffering. Uh, you know, how, what will it take to get you to change your mind? I'm paraphrasing the way that she phrased it, but the implication was, hey, isn't it bad that you're not willing to directly confront Russia over what they're doing in Ukraine? But again, if you're sad because of the suffering, I understand that. That's a human thing. But that expands suffering. It becomes a World War III. It becomes something much bigger than what we're currently seeing. And then you pit two nuclear-armed countries who have 90% of the world's stockpile of nuclear missiles against each other. Not a risk I want to take because we're talking about humanity here. So it's huge, absolutely huge. Let's let's just finish this, we're almost done here. Released as a result. Well, he's the leader of Ukraine, so he's empowered to have a negotiation with Russia and we're here to support those efforts. Yes. Again, I'm not gonna get ahead of a negotiation but we are here to support those efforts. We discuss and have conversations with him, with his team on a daily basis. Yeah. So I wish that reporters didn't frame their questions to suggest that not being antagonistic is, uh, you know, bad. But here we are. Viking North Gamer says this is the beginning of World War Three. Sorry, but I think it is. I hope not. I hope you're I hope you're wrong about that. I absolutely don't want this to be bigger than it is. It's already catastrophic and awful. So I think that, you know, the Biden administration has a responsibility to do everything in their power to try to de-escalate and focusing on diplomatic talks, you know, focusing on the ways that we can facilitate some sort of ceasefire or peace agreement. That's what's really important. Not forcing the Biden administration or pressuring the Biden administration rather to be more aggressive.